Good day YouTube. Warbles on a lot here. Time to have another magnetic flywheel movie. A proper mad scientist job. And it's not because I didn't cover the issue fairly thoroughly in the previous four part series. But I've been getting a continuous chorus of comments from people who seriously seem to think that the geometry doesn't matter if they can just boost the strength of the magnetic field. So, let's go and have a bit of a look at some ancestral magnets and see if I can explain things and, you know, communicate the information. So, we will begin with a Model T Ford of a magnet, alright? Permanent magnet, built and branded by the Ford Motor Company of the excited states of Norte Americano, for use in a motor car. Did you think I was joking? The fix or repair daily magnet. From back in the days when motor cars had permanent magnets in them to make them go. Now the theory with this is that a clamp went across there on that faintly visible depression. Another clamp went across there. There was a wooden peg. And the magnet hung on a peg. And there was actually a circle of pegs around the centre of a flywheel which had uh, a layer of fibre plate to insulate the magnets from the metal of the flywheel. So hanging on their wooden peg, held on there by a clamp, there would be another identical magnet beside it, only it would have its north face lined up with this one's north face, and another one here and another one there, all the way around the circle you had these permanent magnets with their north faces clamped together and their south faces clamped together and then you could have a pickup coil out here and when you hand crank your Model T Ford it spun the wheel and spinning the wheel meant you got north pole, south pole, north pole, south pole going past your pickup coil and that gave you a low tension current to run your spark plugs on okay so we've got a Model T Ford permanent magnet here we have a magnetic compass and as we walk over toward the Ford magnet, we find that the magnet exerts a considerable effect on the compass needle. Okay, everybody understands that. What a lot of people don't seem to understand is that the compass needle is itself a magnet. So at the moment, you've got a line of force that runs from the centre of the North Pole to the centre of the North Pole on the magnet. Uh, the, it's actually, the um, magnetically, it's the south face, but it points to the North Pole, so it's called the north end of the compass needle. Right? And you get another one there. So... Your magnetic field lines actually come out of the centre of here and run around and go back into the centre of there. That's what this is showing. Once we get around behind the face, things start to get a little bit interesting. You come out here and you find you've got a direct magnetic line there. Now, if you were to come in here with an actual magnet, North Pole here against North Pole there, they would repel. And they would repel at all of these angles, not just that angle there. So you got to allow for the angle of the dangle of the repulsiveness or the attractiveness of your magnetic field. And just to complete the demonstration, we come up around here. Right? So, whereas I said your magnetic field lines come out of here and run across to there, in that sort of a curve, they also come out of here and run all the way around on the R side of the magnet to go back in on that side. Right. Now, how strong is it? Using our pocket salter balance, 
with a piece of soft iron as a magnetic keeper so it's going to change its polarity every time you stick it up to a magnet. So here we see the test rig. Right? And we find first bit of information the magnet weighs one pound. <clears throat> I'll read these figures off. Two pounds, two and a half, three pounds, three and a half, four pounds, four and a half, five pounds, five and a half, six pounds, six and a half, seven pounds. There we go. One pound magnet and it'll pull seven pounds. As a first comparison, here's a different magnet, weighs only half a pound, and we'll see what it can pull. Four pounds, five pounds. Okay, so the fix or repair daily magnet pulls maybe six pounds, seven pounds. So we've got about three and a half pound of pull off each end here. And these add up to 0.456 of a square inch, right? So, let's call it half a square inch of pole area, and we're pulling about 6 pounds. So we're getting 12 pound of pull to the square inch, or 12 pounds of repulsion to the square inch. So, let's have a bit of a play with a magnetic flywheel test rig. This probably should say about Mark 6 or something, because the Mark 5 was the one where we only had, I think it's 8 stacks of 2 pot magnets up against 7 stacks of 2 pot magnets. And the Mark 5A, we had a long balanced oscillating magnet, which I've since replaced with a short balanced oscillating magnet. And, uh, this is the one that runs just as well backwards as forwards. See how it converts kinetic energy stored in the flywheel into noise by wobbling the magnet. And the magnetic fields literally feel each other out. But the theory is that if we got a strong and powerful magnet, then uh, it might be able to just push itself. So we'll first find out which end is going to repel. Hmm. What's that doing down there? It just oscillates. Let's turn that over and try the south face. Right, that just attracts, right? So, if we get that into a repulsion position, maybe, yeah, well, that's not going to happen either because it's cogging too hard. But here we go. Three pound to push, and it won't work. But let's... There's a couple of other things that I can think of. One of them would be to increase the power of this fix or repair daily magnet. How could we do that? Well, what we do is we introduce it to the magnetic repolarizer. Here we go, YouTube. Welcome to the Warbles on a Lot family. Ancestral Model T Ford Horseshoe Magnet Repolarization Machine. Doesn't it look like a Dalek? Isn't it lovely? What we have here is a great big lump of soft iron wrapped up with, I don't know, maybe half a mile or something of varnished copper wire. The whole thing wrapped up in oiled cotton calico string um, canvas 
plus <coughs> string and then maybe 10 or 15 years ago I gave it an extra coating of uh, nylon baling twine but uh, this thing weighs 18 pounds and we have precisely two square inches of pole area and even though it's not powered up it does have a residual field in its core. Okay well to get the electricity that means we're going to have to burn some petrol in the Chinese generator. Okay so that started up pretty good. Here we have a slight side track. No more tappet running see Tony. Shout out the racing driver. 05. Okay, so we have our exhaust turbine running and we are showing 15 and a half volts open circuit. Change the setting for amps. Seventeen amps, sixteen amps, pretty impressive. It's only supposed to be eight. Okay, so now that's hooked up. Let's check the voltage. Sucking it down to ten and a half. If I was charging a battery, that would be about thirteen and a half volts and maybe five amps. Okay, so now I'm feeding through the amp meter, 4.66, 4.7 amps. And here we have a compass needle. Much stronger response. Right. Locks on pretty well. Forgive the delicacy of this test rig. Okay, so it took about uh, 26, 28 pounds. And even then it bent the hook on the scales. And now we will repeat. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there we go. Going from six pounds up to ten pounds. Let's try that one again. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yep, ten pounds. So there's now five pounds of repulsiveness coming out of there instead of three. So let's try it. So strangely going from three ounces to three pounds and then three pounds to five pounds worth of magnetic repulsion, it just doesn't matter. And if you were to try and have a camshaft on the wheel, organising a push rod to somehow try and waggle the magnet, the spring to pull the magnet back in has to be more powerful than the magnetic field that it's trying to overcome and then the magnet has to move about five times further than the cam follower moves so you're going to multiply that force of the spring 
by five and therefore the flywheel is never going to have enough power to turn. But what if we have a really kick-ass magnet? What if we take this and expose it to that field there? How's that for a trick? Yeah? Hillbilly hermits aren't as bloody silly as they look, eh? 25 pound for half a square inch, four square inches. So what we've got over here, at a square inch, that's a 50 pound magnetic repulsive field. So why is it not spinning? not spinning because the sum of the vectors equals zero. There are 360 degrees in a circle and 180 degrees in a triangle. And magnetism is an inverse square propagation law type phenomenon. So, when we switch the big field off, it doesn't work any better than when it's on. Magnetic flywheels are not a physical possibility. Doesn't matter how strong your magnets, right? does not matter how strong your magnets. We just had that thing set up with a 50 pound magnetic pull but it also had a 50 pound magnetic push and it did nothing. But on the other hand you all did learn that there was in fact a Model T Ford magnet and you learned how to repower them. <laughs>